Today I'm going to talk, uh, preach on the subject of surrender to the miraculous. Surrender to the miraculous. It's found in Acts chapter 12. I've preached out of this, but this is not uh, the same sermon that I've ever preached before. But I want to bring and draw out some principles here that I want you to see. I pray that your eyes will be open. And I want to shed light, if I may, on why God doesn't always heal immediately, give us the miracle that we want immediately. Sometimes he does. Sometimes it's progressive. Sometimes it seems as if that prison door will never open, that valley will never come out of, or that dark night will never end. I want you to see from Scripture, and I pray that God will give me the ability through His Holy Spirit to convey to you what the Spirit of God has been saying to me this week, and that you would see with spiritual eyes and hear with spiritual ears. Chapter 12, verse 1 of Acts. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Verse 5, everyone see this carefully. Peter, therefore, was kept. Everyone say that with me. Peter was therefore kept. Think about that for a moment. Peter, therefore, was kept. For us who have faith, who believe, who know the power of God, it is speaking to us even now, Peter was kept. Now, if you read on, it says, in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. So he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Father, thank you for the blessed word that has been read. I pray, Lord, that we would draw out the truths, the principles that are unchanging and apply them to our lives for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now, there's no doubt, beloved, we believe in the power of supernatural miracles. We pray, we bind, we knock, we seek, we ask, we loose. And God brings miracles in his time. He may do it immediately, as we have had so many testify, even at the altar here, so many have come back to me and said, you know, the day that we prayed for that need, God healed me that day, and that week I went to the doctor, and the doctor confirmed it. Other times, it's progressive. They walk away. They may feel something, but they may not see any change, but they walk in faith. The strong Christian, those who understand the word, they apprehend it and they embrace it. Then there are weak Christians and they can only survive on manna and miracles. Hear what I'm saying. 
They can only survive on manna and miracles, whereby strong Christians survive on meat, miracles, and indeed, misery. You see, folks, nowhere in Scripture does it tell us that you or I will be exempt from problems. Nowhere in Scripture does it say if you just get saved, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, you will never have a prison experience. You'll never walk through a dark valley. But strong, mature disciples can rest even when they do not see the miracle straight ahead. They know they can trust God. They know they can believe and the miracle will come. And we learn, listen, through every storm, there is a lesson. Through every prison experience, there's a lesson. God does not waste these experiences on his children. Yesterday, Elder Frank Vassallo and I were talking in the uh, office. We were praying together, and he mentioned something that I thought was very insightful. He said that when Jesus constrained the disciples to get into a boat and to go over to the other side, in Mark chapter 4, verse 41, Jesus was in the boat with them, and Jesus fell asleep. Now, I want you to hear this. It's very important. As they, were, as they were cruising across the Sea of Galilee, a terrible storm came up. The wind was, was whipping across the, the, the bow, and the waves were crashing, and it looked as if the boat would tip over, and they would drown. In fact, the disciples had even come to that conclusion. So they awakened Jesus and they said to him, Master, we are imperiled in this storm. Now I want you to understand something. Brother Frank brought this out. He said before, and you can read that in the early chapters of Mark, Jesus had healed lepers. He had healed the palsy. He had healed the demon possessed. They had seen him heal in so many ways. But when Jesus was awakened and he stood in the bow of the boat, he said, peace, be still. And the storm immediately stopped. You know what their response was? Behold, what manner of man is this that even the winds and storms obey his command. You see, you may have experienced God's saving grace in your own life or in a sickness or someone you prayed for, but now you're in a completely different experience and God wants to display his unique power in every situation. You've seen him heal before. He's going to teach you something new and something unique and different. Jesus is my storm shelter. I want you to say that. Jesus is my storm shelter. Now hear me. Jesus is a storm stopper. He can stop that storm at any time. But sometimes he indeed allows us to go through a storm so that we might learn something different we didn't know before. We need to say, Lord, whatever it is you're teaching me, help me to hold on, help me to trust, help me to believe, and help me to pursue. Some of you right now, you're going through a prison experience. There are a lot of weak Christians. They have to go from one prophecy to another, one miracle to another. And if they don't see that miracle happen right away, well, this church must not be powerful enough. I'm going to go over here, or I'm going to go to this crusade, or I, I don't mind people going wherever the Spirit leads them. But understand, there are times when God says, no, you're not going to see the miracle today. You're going to see my hand of deliverance. You're going to see something you've never seen before. Amen. Christian, hold on. Let your faith grow. You see so many, they would rather rely upon a, a miracle 
than to know the word and to trust God. How did Jesus overcome the enemy when Satan tempted Jesus? He said, it is written. When he was tempted with the, the lust of the flesh, it is written. The pride of life, it is written. Every time he was tempted, Jesus said, it is written. Let me give you an example of that. When the Israelites crossed the Jordan in Joshua chapter 5. Now listen, when we come out of Egypt, we come out of the world. Egypt is a picture of the world. All of its sins, all of its habits, all of its failures, all of its misery, all of the void of a spiritual understanding, that is Egypt. Israelites came out of Egypt in a miraculous show of God's power. He parted the Red Sea. The children of Israel went across on dry ground, and when Pharaoh and his army came pursuing, they were crushed and they were defeated and drowned in the Red Sea. They started singing the praises of Moses. Miriam led them in a song to Moses. Forty years, listen, they lived a life, hear me, of shallowness, of criticism, of carping and complaining. My wife last night, it was interesting, as she was studying, she said to me, what one great thing did the Israelites do in the wilderness? I said, well, they received the Ten Commandments, but that was from Moses. They defeated a few foes, but you know the greatest, the greatest enemy the children of Israel had in the wilderness was their flesh. And you find today, carnal Christians are those who want to stay in the wilderness. They want a little of the world and a little bit of the promised land, but they want to stay in the carnality in the wilderness. You know how you find out? Let somebody offend them and see how they react. Put them under duress and see how they act. Put them in prison for a day, turn the lights out, see how they act. Put them in a valley of experience where they can't see a foot in front of them and hear what comes out of their mouths. You've never heard so much complaining and carping. They turned their affections against Moses. They wanted to kill Moses. They complained and they said, weren't there, enough, uh, weren't there enough graveyards in Egypt? You brought us out into this wilderness. Folks, that is the life of carnality. The life of carnality has to live from one sign to another. God does miracles all the time. God will bring you through what you are experiencing in miraculous form. But he may delay. Now, I want to say something to you. If you do not have a theology of delay, you better get one. It's the same with Mary and Martha. They said if Jesus had come before our brother died, he would never have died. You know what Jesus said? When he heard that his friend Lazarus was sick, it says in the scripture, he abode two more days. And then he said, hey, we need to go to Bethany. By the time they got to Bethany, Mary is, is pleading and Martha is pouting and Jesus comes along and he says, where did you put the body? And they, he said, take me there. And they said, it's been four days. Four days. Jesus lets his friend not only be sick, but indeed die. And he said, take me to the sepulcher. What was the response from his sister? By now the body stinketh. That's the way we look at things. When God doesn't come through the way we want him to, we say, by now the problem stinks. By now even Jesus can't turn it around. Listen to me. He is the God of the impossible. There's nothing he cannot do. Don't you say, oh, it's past the, the 11th hour. It's past the midnight hour. He can turn time around. He can provide whatever you need. Amen. 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 Praise God. 
Now, when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, listen, you know what the Lord said to them? It was at Gilgal. Now, I know that the Israelites wanted to go out and conquer Jericho right away, post haste. But God told Joshua, tell the people to encamp there at Gilgal and make sharp knives, and we're going to reinstitute circumcision. What was circumcision? It was the covenant seal of the Abrahamic covenant. God was not going to let them wander through that land of the Canaanites and the Philistines and the Perizzites and the Hittites and then let them assimilate into those other cultures. What was the seal of the covenant of Abraham? Circumcision. He said, I want you to circumcise every man that, that was born in the wilderness. You don't circumcise in the wilderness. It's too dirty. If you're going to have an operation, you're not going to do it in some sandy pit. So when they were in the promised land, he said to them, you're not going to move forward. You're not going to pass go. You're going to circumcise the men. And by the way, the manna is going to cease. You talk about a shallow Christian. You know what? They have to have manna. You know what manna was? It was angel food. It literally fell down in the morning and it fell down in the evening. All they had to do was go out and pick up the manna and eat the manna. That is angel food for babies. When they crossed the Jordan River and God said to Gilgal, you're going to circumcise and by the way, the manna is going to stop tomorrow. He didn't wean them off. He didn't say in two weeks. He said, tomorrow the manna ceases. Listen to me, beloved. Some of you today, you need to get off of baby food. Amen. Hear what I'm saying. We think, oh, he is such a strong Christian. Well, why is it? He can rejoice with miracles, but you let somebody offend him and he wants to leave the church. Somebody says something, hurts his feelings. Oh, you've never seen such a display. That's immaturity. You need to endure the meat of the word. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and chapter 3 as well, he said, I wanted to send you meat, but you weren't ready. You're still on baby food. Some of you right now, you need to get off baby food and you don't need to start enduring or ingesting the word of God that will transform your life. Amen. To understand, to understand, if God doesn't provide the miracle today, he may tomorrow or he may next week, but he is still God. Amen. Whether there's a miracle today, tomorrow, or a month from now, he is still God and he hasn't forgotten you. Amen. Hallelujah. Now listen very quickly. I'm going to hit the high points. I'm behind a little bit, but trust me here. Hang with me. Three facets to test our faith. Number one, James was killed. Listen to me carefully. Sometimes the unthinkable happens. Do you hear me? Sometimes in our lives as Christians, the unthinkable happens. The divorce came through. She had an affair. He was arrested. There were drugs involved. Pastor, we lost him. I lost my job. We're going to have to declare bankruptcy. But why didn't God prevent this? Why did God let Herod take James? James was a pillar in the church. Why did God take him home? He was, he was a man that we needed. He was a man with potential. We don't understand certain things because in the sovereignty of God, we can't see be, beyond uh, right ahead because the Bible says we see through a glass darkly. We don't see everything involved. But when God chose to allow Herod to take the life of this man, God showed him he is still in control. He wanted to take Peter, and the Lord said, no. God controls everything, and he can only, the enemy can only go so far. 
You can go this far and no farther. But we want to skirt suffering so badly. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to go through a prison experience. I don't want to go through a dark valley. Lord, if it's all the same, I would rather just skip this all together. If you can find a way of escape for me to go out the other way, I'll be happy to. The other day I was telling, I think it was on a Wednesday night, I was on the internet and I was reading something and I saw in one of those, you know, sidebars, they have these things that uh, always pique your interest and they, they had uh, a picture of a man, they said, uh, uh, the last picture of, of several people before they, they were deceased. And I noticed the picture of this guy was a mountain climber. And I read the story how he wanted to ascend so many feet on a such and such a mountain. And it piqued my curiosity how many of them. And I started looking through. I was amazed how many people actually had pictures of themselves before they died trying to climb to the peak of a mountain. Now, folks, there's nothing wrong with climbing to the peak of a mountain, but you can't abide in a mountain. Even Jesus told Peter when they were at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Shekinah glory of God came down. There was Moses, Elijah, Jesus. Peter was so excited, he said, Jesus, let's just stay here, and we, we don't even have to ascend or descend from this mountain. We'll stay here and build three booths, one to you, one to Moses, one to Elijah. Jesus said, no. You've seen the glory of God. Now we're going to go down and see the misery. When they descended, there was a man waiting on them whose son was possessed of a devil. And he said, it takes my son and throws him into the fire, throws him into the water. And I came to your disciples and they couldn't deliver him. Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith. You know what? I truly believe they could have, they could have, delivered that demon-possessed boy on a mountain. But when it came down to the valley, you see, things grow in the valley. Nothing grows on the mountain. Remember the song we used to sing? He's the lily of the valley, the bride and morning star. He's the lily of the valley. The beauty and the glory develops in the valley. Your soul will grow in the prison. Your faith will grow when it's met with adversity. I cannot explain to you why God allowed your daughter to be taken or your mother to die or the divorce to be imminent. I can't explain it. But I know if you trust God, he will get you through it and you will grow and be stronger by the experience. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus ministered because sometimes the unthinkable happens to people who are very close to us. Jesus ministered with, to Judas or with Judas for over three years. Psalm 41, 9 says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Jesus said, And your enemy will be of your own family. Don't think you're exempt from miseries. Don't think you're exempt from storms. Peter says, think it not strange, the fiery trials which are to try you as though some strange thing has happened. James was killed. Number two, Peter was kept. How do you figure that, pastor? Peter, therefore, was kept. That tells me that Satan can only go so far. Do you hear what I'm saying? God prepares a hedge around his children. He places a hedge around us, and Satan can only come up to that line only so far. He can't cross that line. He can yell his epithets at you. He can excoriate you. He can malign you, but he cannot step across that line. <laughs> to Job... What did Satan say? Well, yeah, he won't curse you because you've put a hedge around him. The Lord said, I'll remove the hedge. You can touch his body. 
You can even disease him, but you can't take his life. Satan said, I'll tell you what, I'll put a disease on him that's so bad, he will curse you to your face. And God said, knock yourself out. Here he is sitting on rubble with a pod share scraping the boils on his face. His wife comes up to him and says, you've been through everything. Why not curse God and die? Boy, that's heavy stuff. He's taken away my family. He's taken away my business. He's taken away everything that I own. I own nothing. And now I've got this disease that is attacking my body. And I'm not supposed to, to say anything. I'm not supposed to complain to God. He cursed the day he was born. He cursed the people who saw him being born, but he never cursed God. God knows how much you and I can take. And when you or when the enemy gets to that line, the Lord says, enough. The Lord says, that is enough. Beloved, that means that we need to prepare ourselves because redemption is coming. The prison is going to open. The door is going to be set free. I'm just going to free will because I've only got so many minutes. Now, I've, I've said many times, if I were in the prison, I was on schedule the next day to be executed. There are a lot of things I could do, but sleeping wouldn't be one of them. I think I could eat. I've always been able to eat. But sleeping is a different matter. I told the early service that, that when the angel came, I love this, when the, the scripture says, and the angel came upon him. I love this. This is beautiful. It doesn't say he had to pull bars back like a, a monster. It doesn't say that he had to slide through between bars or break over the, the top. It says he came upon him. Listen, in your darkest hour, when you think you can't take it one more minute, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and things are going to change. You are going to get out of the prison. Listen to me carefully. The scripture says in verse 9, and he went out. There's coming a time. I don't know when it will be. Maybe it'll be tomorrow. Maybe it'll be next week, but I promise you, you're going to get out of the prison experience. You're going to get through the valley experience, and when you traverse it, you're going to be changed like you've never been changed before. God is going to do a divine work in your life. Listen to me. Some have resigned to prison life. Some of you just as, you know what? I give up. I'm just going to be a prisoner. No, you aren't. That is the devil speaking, and you need to tell him, in God's time, I'm getting out of this place. Look at Joseph. All the years, Joseph never changed his MO. He had been given a talent of interpreting dreams, and he didn't go halfway and say, well, God has forgotten me. I'm going to just change and be something else. At the right time, God said, now you're coming out. Now you're coming out. Blessed is the man who walketh through the valley of Baca. Because when you walk through it, it's a place of bitterness. It's a place of hurt and pain. But you transform it by the grace of God and the love of God. And when you get through that valley, your soul has been changed. Your mind has been renewed. And you have become more into the image of Christ Jesus. And I, and I end with this. I end with this. It says, verse 9, Peter wist not that it was true that he thought it was a vision. 
Walking through each ward is another blessing. When you walk through the first ward, you will gain knowledge and understanding of God. You go through the second ward, you gain more understanding and knowledge of God's grace and his love. And when you get to the iron gate, I love this. Read what it says. If I can find it, verse 10. And when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. Now that's either talking about Peter or it's talking about God. But it opened of his own accord. When you get to that place, listen, you don't have to kick iron gates down. God will open them at the right time. The chains will fall off your hands and your feet. You are to gird your loins to prepare yourself. Some of you right now, even if God took the chains off your hands and your feet and opened the gate, you wouldn't be ready. You've got to gird your loins. Be ready because right now it may be redemption or tomorrow, but we must be ready. Amen. Stand to your feet.